I want you to make it better. I want you to make it better. And the question is going to be, what if he never makes it better? See him? Here. Great. Praise the Lord. Okay, they're hallelujah. And they can you go, aren't you miserable? No, I'm really not. What do you have that I don't have? Jeez. Don't shut down. Don't give up. Don't become bitter. Surround yourself with people who love Jesus. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of. All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to those of you that are here in Phoenix. As we always say, we're glad you're with us. For those of you joining us online, Apps, Roku, or YouTube, we're glad you're joining us also. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. There you can get handouts for today's lesson. You can get past lessons, catch up on this series, all different series. Anything you want to know about us is on there. We are at the very last day of our Proverbs series. We named it Live Different because that is what our goal for this whole series is, is for us to walk away saying, okay, how is it that I'm supposed to live different? How do I become a Christian and then start living a different kind of a life? And we say it's, most of it is just because you need to read the Bible and Proverbs is such a big piece of that to learn how to live different because we've learned so many things about it. So... I want to talk a little bit about one thing we didn't talk about, and then I want to pull the whole series together at the very, very end. And we'll, we'll end with one final word, but we've seen Proverbs, we've seen these contrasts all through Proverbs. We've seen the fool versus the wise. We've seen the naive and the simple versus a person who has wisdom. We've seen righteous versus wicked, and we've seen all these contrasts in Proverbs. So I want to talk this morning about um, another contrast, and it's something we haven't talked about, which is rich and poor. And it's a huge contrast. And what I want to start by saying is some of you probably are going to fall on the rich category. Someone said if you make over $2 a day, you're rich in the world's eyes. But in the United States of America, we kind of have, you know, the rich over here and the poor over there. And what exactly does that mean? But some of you have nice homes and you have vehicles to get you places and you don't worry about where you're going to get your next dollar so that you can actually buy food. So we're going to say that that's you. And and then you've got other people that, that are, are, we would fall on the poor side, and, and they struggle. They maybe live in an apartment. They you know, try to make their rent. They don't have money to buy food. They don't know where their next meal's coming from. They don't have a car. Like, all these things. So you have these two contrasting kinds of people. But what I want to show you today is that, is that God looks at the poor and the rich completely different than you and I do. A person in God's eyes with money can actually be considered very poor. And a person that's very, very poor in God's eyes could be the richest person in the entire world. There was a father of a very wealthy, wealthy family, and he took his son on a trip to show him what it was actually like. I don't, you've probably heard this before. He took him out to the country to show him how poor people really live. They, live, they spend a night with um, a family that was considered very, very poor. When they came back, the father asked the son, what did you think of our trip? And, and he said, the son was like, it was like the most amazing trip I've ever seen. And he said, well, now do you understand how poor people live? And he said, yeah, I did, Dad. And the father said, what did you learn? And he said, well, I saw that we have a dog at home and they have four. He said, we have a pool that reaches to the middle of the garden, but they have a creek that literally runs to where there's no end. He said, we have electric lamps in the garden, but they have a sky full of stars. Our patio goes to the wall around the property, but they have the whole horizon. He said, thank you, Dad, for showing me how poor we really are. And I thought when I read that, that that's so true because we have this whole idea, especially living here in the United States, this whole, that we need to be rich and we need to have money and we need to be wealthy and have all of these things. But we learned something. Here's our first quote. I can't remember if I put this in the handout or not. There you go. All of us have at some point in time or another seen extremely rich, wealthy, and famous people unhappier than what we would expect them to be, given the amount of material benefits that they have. It's surprising that a large number of wealthy people do not seem to experience the happiness that one would expect goes with so much money and riches. A study conducted by University of Illinois indicated that more than 30% of the richest people in America were not as happy as the person who earned a modest income. 
All we have to do is look at the news, look at, you know, Entertainment Tonight. We see Whitney Houston with all the money and everything she has, and she was miserable and dies. Michael Jackson, Robin Williams, Mindy McCready, Kurt Cobain. These are big names in big industries, and they're so miserable that they take drugs and they kill themselves. Like, this is, a, this is just, and you think, what is wrong with them? Here's our next screen. Someone wrote this. There are people so poor that the only thing they have is money. And I thought that was a really, really great statement. So let's talk about what Proverbs says. Proverbs 22, verse 2 says this. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. See, in other words, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't really matter because God is the one who created you and then created you in the status that you're, you're at. What matters to God is never how much money you have, but actually what's in your heart regarding the money that you have. When the Israelites were going into the promised land, they'd wandered for, of course, 40 years. They got into the promised land. God had taken care of them for 40 years. He fed them. He made sure they had water. He made sure that they had clothes that never wore out, shoes that never wore out. Like God really, really took care of them. And yet when they got into the promised land of Israel, God had this huge warning for them because he knew what happens sometimes when we get wealth, when we get money. And it's never really good. Look at Deuteronomy 8. This was the warning, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land um, the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character, to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't blister or swell. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out into the valley and hills. This is a land they're going to be going into. Look at what he says about it. It's a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. It's a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It's a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Now, I want to stop and talk about this for a second because it sounds in a weird sense like when we talk about money, and I'm not talking about money today, it's just more about this whole contrast of rich and poor. But so many people think, well, the Bible just must say that I can't have nice things and I shouldn't make money. And I want you to know that that's absolutely not true. God has blessed the Israelites in this land with all of this great stuff. It just mattered what they did with it. I guess that's the bottom line. Um, Instead of saying that you have all of these things in your life, I have money, I have all this wealth, what God is trying to say is never forget that if you fall on that rich side, where all of that came from. Because so many people say, if I'm successful, it's because of something I did. I went to Harvard, I'm smart, I'm a great business person, I just have this sixth sense about me, I just know how to do things. And the the question is, do you credit yourself? Do you give yourself all kinds of credit, or does God get the credit? Does he get the credit if you have your own business and jobs come along? Does he get credit if your church, more people show up? Does he get credit if you have that degree at Harvard? Like, who gets the credit in your life? And God is always saying, he's the one who needs to get the credit. Look at verse 11. But that is the time when you get into the promised land, is what he's saying. When when, when things are plentiful, when life is good, and you have money to buy things. Look what he says. But that's the time to be careful. Beware that's in your plenty, beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud of that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with his poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with man in the wilderness, to food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all of this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. 
But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. But I assure you of this, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. See, from this verse, we can be assured that if you have money here and you have wealth and you have these things and all the nice things that you have, it's because God has blessed you with it. If you do not have money, let's just go down that direction, I want you to to understand that if God is the one who creates and gives wealth and, and has someone rich or has someone poor, then regardless, God wants you to be content exactly where you're at. We see this with the Apostle Paul. He's out sharing the gospel and he gets thrown into prison. And he's in a very, very dark, dark, dark prison in, in Rome. But the thing that we, we see about Paul is that I don't think he really wanted to be there. But that's the place that God had him. For you and I, when we lack financially, we don't want to be there either. But we have to learn to be content exactly where God has us. Sitting in a prison cell, I think this is the one thing that we as followers of Jesus need to remember. If I give my life to Christ, I'm saying, God, my life is not my own any longer. It's not. It's yours. You do, you do whatever you want with me. And, and sometimes that means you get to go to the beach. Sometimes it means you get to go to a prison cell. Sometimes it means you have a full bank account, and sometimes it means you have an empty one. Sometimes it means you're married, sometimes it means not. Sometimes babies, sometimes not. Sometimes boyfriends, sometimes not. See, God's saying, as a follower of mine, I'm going to lead you and guide you, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to be content if you're at a place that you don't really want to be at. And I think that's a very valuable lesson. Philippians 4 says this, Paul says this. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. That's just life. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. Uh, churches are going to go great. Churches are going to crumble. People are going to have financial you know, windfalls, and then they're not. And God is saying, through it all, I need you to trust me, and I need you to know that I, am, I can take care of you in those times. Two little teardrops were floating down the river of life. One teardrop asked, who are you? The first teardrop said, I'm the teardrop from a girl who loved a man and lost him. The other one said, well, I'm the teardrop from the girl who got him. Now, it's kind of a weird thinking like that, but it's like we all have things in our life that that is good to one and bad to the other. And so we have to look at life like that. But I realized when Paul said this, that we have to be content whether you're either teardrop, I guess is my point to that. I realized this with this week. Most of you probably know we had a business that we sold last year. And when we sold the business, our accountant said, you need to put this much money aside for taxes. And so we did. And then on April 15th, they came up with a tax bill that was way beyond what they told us to do. And I, I, Rob was so cute because he knew I would probably be like, what just happened? But he read this verse in Philippians about being content. They said, we've got to be content wherever God has us, whether, it's, where, whether you have to pay money, more money than you thought or not. And I realized that I was content. I was fine for the first time. Like last year, I would have been a disaster. This year, I've grown so much knowing God's always going to take care of me. So I don't have to worry about that. But I started thinking, what if we could all live like that? where we just sat down and said, God, you have given me this particular seat on this bus, this particular house, this particular husband, whatever. But some of you, you might be in the poor seat. That just might be the seat on your bus for your whole life. And maybe your seat just means you're going to live paycheck to paycheck for the rest of your life. Maybe your seat means you have to pay that school loan off or that medical bill for the rest of your life. Maybe your seat means you're never, ever going to have extra money like everybody else. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are you going to be content exactly where God has you? Maybe, on the other hand, you have the rich seat on the bus. And what you need to know as a follower of Jesus, and if you get all of this right, that it's, it's all a gift from him, would you be content to know that as a Christian, your job is, your money is a tool to help? churches grow, help people come to know Christ all over the world, would you be content in helping others if you were on the rich seat? Because I think there's serious implications to both seats on this bus. 
when God told the Israelites that he is the one that gives the ability to be rich. And I think of those people that are really rich, and I think, imagine the responsibility that they have to, to do with their money what God is, needs them to do with it. So sometimes I think maybe it's better to be on the poor seat of the bus because there's not as much um, responsibility as a poor person it would be as a rich person, I would assume that. But so many people live this life discontented because they always want what they can't have. They always think that there's more out there. There's, I want a better income bracket. I want a better job. I want a better man to be married to. I want a better house to live in. And people move on with this elusive dream that, 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 you know, yeah, God has me poor, but I got to do everything I can to get rich. And I think we have that all backwards. Someone wrote Ann Landers. She was very discontented with her life, this woman. This is what she writes. Did I put it on the screen? There you go. Dear Ann, sometimes you feel lonely and unloved in a marriage, even after 23 years. You feel as if there's got to be more to life. And I was thinking about this with money. Some people think this with money too. So you set out to find someone who can make you blissfully happy. You believe you found that someone and decide he's exactly what you want. So you pack up, say goodbye to your 23-year marriage and all the friends you've made when you were part of the couple. You live the glorious life for a few years. Then a light bulb goes on in your empty head. You realize that you have exactly the life you had before. The only difference is that you've lost your friends, your children's respect, the best friend you loved and shared everything with for 23 years, and you realize you miss him. You cannot undo what has been done, so you settle for a lonely and loveless life with emptiness in your heart. She says, Anne, please print my letter so others won't give up something that is truly precious and let them know that they won't know how precious it is until they have thrown it away. See, I think that the same is found with those who have money. They're so seeking it. They lose so many things in the process instead of just saying, you know what, I need to be content where God's given me. Instead of always trying to chase this elusive dream of more money, more money, and in the process, a lot of times, you lose family and friends, and that's what happens. I think I told you, or maybe I didn't, I can't remember when. Rob and I first got married. The first 10 years of our marriage was a disaster. I think I probably told you that, but... His whole thing in life was to chase the elusive dream of making a lot of money. And I will never forget when he came in, he was going on a business trip one time, and he walked in the bedroom and he looked at me and he said, I just want you to know that, that you and the kids will always come second to my business trips. That's it. That's just the way it is. And we almost blew up our marriage because it just wasn't working. He was chasing this elusive dream until God saved him. And then when God saved him, it's a whole new ball game now. But... But so many people lose things because they're out there trying to find something that God, God says, that's not what I have for you. I don't have for you to be wealthy. You might be on the poor seat where he says, that's where I want you. My dad's so cute. He's always convinced he's going to win the lottery. My dad, I think, is 87. And he always buys lottery tickets. So I had to go pick him up the other day to take him to get his haircut. We go by and he says, stop right here at this uh, Circle K. I need to get lottery tickets. So I ran in and got him his lottery tickets. He went and got his haircut. On the way back, he says, Oh, stop at that other Circle K. We need to get more lottery tickets over there. Apparently, he thinks like one is better than the other. I don't know. So I go, all right. He gives me his $20. So I go in, get him his lottery tickets. He comes in the car. I come back in the car, and so I hand it to him. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, those are for you. And I said, oh, Dad, let me give you a little clue on this. I said, when I buy lottery tickets, it's usually when it's about a half a billion dollars, and, and I buy one ticket because I'm pretty sure God does not want me to win. So I, I only buy one, I waste two bucks, that's fine. But I do know if God's big enough, that God's big enough, if he wants me to win, God will make sure I have those numbers. So I don't even have to worry about that. But I told him, I said, Dad, I couldn't even imagine the responsibility of, of having that kind of money. It, it could destroy people's lives. I said, I couldn't, like, I couldn't imagine if my dad won. Like, what would happen to, you know, long-lost cousins who would call my dad and say, oh, I need to lo- loan. It would be exhausting. I'm like, ah, I would just, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Jack Whitaker, he uh, won a 90-some dollar, he actually got $90 million cash because uh, he won the lottery. But he said it was completely different getting $90 million cash and his, it was a bad way, then when he actually uh, lived in poverty growing up, he grew up, started a business, worked his way to the top, made $17 million on his own. He said it's two completely different worlds when you make money on your own versus when someone just hands you the money. When he got his $90 million, he did some good charitable stuff. He built a few churches in West Virginia. Um, 
But the problem was is that it just overtook him. People were, you know, calling him all the time. I need money. I need a loan. I need all of these kind of things. And he ended up uh, going to the, the bars, leaving half a million dollars in cash. He would go to the strip clubs. Uh, leaving his car, he would be robbed. It was this whole horrible situation. The company that he had was hit with all these lawsuits because now that he won the lottery, it's like everyone's thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to take him for whatever I can. So they, they were suing him. Uh, he enjoyed spoiling his granddaughter, Brandy, so he gave her a huge allowance, okay, for some kid who doesn't even know what to do with money. Uh, he gave her a huge allowance, gave her four cars, which, of course, drew this whole bad crowd. Um, his granddaughter's boyfriend died of an overdose, and then Brandy was actually found dead under circum uh, suspicious circumstances. Uh, Brandy's mom, which is Whitaker's daughter, was found also dead. This goes on and on. I mean, it's just it's this horrible situation. He lost all the people he loved, and by the time it was over, he lost all of his money. And you're like, for what? For, why, for what? Because money, people just think money is going to solve all my problems. Here's what he says. Since I won the lottery, I think there's no control for greed. He said, if you have something, there's always someone else that wants it. I wish I had torn that ticket up. And I thought, oh, that's kind of good. When wealth comes... I think that there's an enormous responsibility as followers of Christ. And, and from God's standpoint, if you have wealth, you should use it to further the gospel. Here's a couple good stories. Les Robbins, I don't know what we put up there if we put this little. Les Robbins uh, won the $111 million jackpot with his newfound fortune. The former middle school teacher purchased 226 acres of land, where he then built a day camp for children, Camp Winnegator. Now, here's the really interesting thing. I don't think we put a little... Um, it's actually a cute little logo of, a, of, a, um, of an alligator. Thing. Oh, yeah, there it is. What's really interesting is I cannot find a picture of this guy. The only thing you can see when you do, like, lottery stuff is his camp. Because he doesn't care that he got the money. He cared that it goes to help people. Anyway, he has this, uh, it inspires children 6 to 16 to disconnect from their devices, enjoy the great outdoors. The lakeside property has... Um, you know, they ride horses, practice painting, and appreciate nature. So that's what he did with his winnings. And, and it sounds to me like everything in him was a great, a great deal because he was giving everything away. Here's our next little couple, Violet and Alan Large. Do we have a picture of them? Yeah. Canadian couple who won $11.2 million. They gave it all away to friends, charities, and hospitals. Uh, they are both in their late 70s. Uh, they said that their good fortune earlier had been the biggest headache of their life. They decided going against a spending spree. This is what she said, what you've never had, you never miss, she told the Toronto Star. So when we're learning about money and rich and poor, when we're talking about wisdom, here's what wisdom says. Wisdom says that money is not bad. So please do not hear me say, if you have a lot of money, that's a bad thing. It's not. It just means God has blessed you. Money isn't bad if it can be used for good. But foolishness, if we're trying to deal with foolishness and wisdom, says this, money is for me to buy things that will make me happy. And all we have to do is look at all these stories to realize money will never make you ever, ever happy. No amount of money will. Kent Crockett, he's a, a Christian author. He, t he writes this story about his mom, how she's always wanted a beach house. Like, that's just what she wanted, a beach house right on the ocean, and she just knew that was going to make her happy. She said, I could just sit, watch the sun go down every night, hear the waves. Like, she was super excited. So when she married Kent's father, they ended up getting a, a little beach house. But here's what he said later. He said, she realized the humidity was terrible. She always felt sticky. She said they would go to the sand. They would walk on the beach like she always dreamed of. Tr the sand would be tracked into the house. It would be in their bed, in their um, you know, couches, in their sandwiches. Everything was, you know. She said after a few months, you just stop looking at the sun sunset. It's just not that big of a deal anymore. And he said that finally one day they just moved away, moved away from the big dream that they thought because things like that will never, ever make you happy. See, we have so much emphasis and we put it on what we have. And we always think this. People think, if I have a lot of money, that means God's blessed me. But if I'm over here and I don't have a lot of money, then God must hate me. And in the United States, for some reason, we have that weird thinking. And I think Proverbs tells us something completely different. Nothing could be farther from the truth. When we went to Africa a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I, I can't remember what I've told you and what I haven't. So if I repeat stories, welcome to my world at this point. But um, 
When we went to um, Africa, I was so amazed at how happy the people were. Like, it just shocked me. They have nothing. They live in huts. They live in, they, they have nothing. And yet there's something about them. They would walk miles to come to church on Sunday morning. And for you and I, if our church service goes over one hour, we're like really frustrated with the pastor. We're like, um, hello, uh, TikTok, I'm hungry and I need to go to eat lunch. And that's just what we do in America because it's like, we don't want to sit longer. Africa's different. You walk into, they've walked miles to get there. Okay, it's dusty, dirty. There's no air conditioning, no fans, no lights. They're up there singing. They're crying. They're praising God. They're so thankful that Jesus saved them. I've never seen, like, I literally walked away from Africa thinking, I don't even think I'm a Christian. Like, I was so shocked, and it's it so just, it ruined me. We walked into a, um, a, a, uh, little church in the middle of the day, and there's all these people sitting there on their knees praying. And I started thinking, I bet they're not praying for a a Louis Vuitton purse or a brand new, you know, house or a Lamborghini. Like, I don't think they were praying for things like that. I think they were praying for loved ones who really, really needed Jesus and food to feed their family and, and healing for their child because they actually didn't afford, couldn't afford any medicine. So I walked away thinking, I think we're missing something here. Here's our next screen here. It says, I I realized this. I had no shoes and complained until I met a man who had no feet. That's how I felt when I got back from Africa. Because I realized that regardless of whether you're rich or poor, and I think the rich people have it harder to, to, to love God even more, as weird as that sounds, because poor people have something we don't, and that is a total dependency on God. Like they just, everything, their next breath, they're depending on him. Their next meal, they're depending on him. They had this great relationship with him. And I don't have that. And I walked away feeling so sad for, 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 for me, because I, I felt sad that I didn't, I didn't have that. I don't think I want it. I mean, I do want that part of dependency, but I don't want to live in Africa and not have anything. But there's this whole weird thing going on there. But we see in Proverbs this. This is the heart that God wants us when it comes to being rich or poor. Look at Proverbs 30, verse 7. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. And here they are. Keep falsehood and lies from far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. And I thought that would be so awesome. Like, what if we could really pray that? God, don't make me rich and and don't make me poor because either way I might forget you. Look at verse nine. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who's the Lord? Otherwise, God, I really might forget you. I might forget that, that, that you saved me and that because you saved me, now I have a job to go out and share you with other people and that you've given me money to do that. God, I, I'm so fearful that maybe something will happen and I'll forget you. Imagine pray, praying, please do not ever let me become wealthy and do not let me win the lottery. And I don't think that's most of our prayers because we say, um, if I win the lottery, God will give you your 10%. Do you think we could say, hey, God, if I win the lottery, I'll give you 99.5 and I'll keep a little bit because maybe I'll just go on a vacation or something. But, but people don't think that because it really is all about us and what we want for ourselves. But I love the reasoning behind Proverbs where he says, God, you're first in my life. And I would be terrified to get money and, and, and never be able to trust you again. I'm afraid I'll forget you. God, I don't ever want to do that. What a great heart. What, pre- what Proverbs teaches is that, that money and riches can take our focus away from God. Proverbs 39 says, that 30 verse 9 says this, otherwise, he says, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or if you go to the other spectrum, he says, or I may be poor and steal so as to dishonor the name of the Lord. He's saying, God, don't give me too much riches, I'll forget you. But God, don't let me be poor because if I am, I'm going to have to go steal food to feed my family. And then that will dishonor you. It's all about God, and it's all about honoring him. One day, a man was walking with a pastor. He knew the pastor was living in Ethiopia in horrible poverty. He was trying to tell him how sad he was for him, and he told the Ethiopian pastor, he said, brother, we pray for you in your poverty. The humble Ethiopian pastor looked at him and said, this is what he said to them. He said, you know, do we have another screen? We pray for you in your prosperity. He said it took the man back, but the Ethiopian pastor explained that we pray for Americans because it's harder for you to live at the place God wants you to live in the midst of prosperity. 
And I totally agree with that. I think people just don't think about God when they have too much in their life. So this is what we want to take away from Proverbs, that what Proverbs is trying to teach us on the next screen. He is rich or poor according to what he ha- what he is, remember, not according to what he has. It doesn't matter what we have, but it's really what, what we are as a person, what we do with the place on the bus that God has given us. Here's some Proverbs for us. Proverbs 28, 6 says, Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Verse 11 says, The rich are wise in their own eyes. One who is poor is discerning, sees how deluded they are. And Proverbs 19.1 says, Better the poor whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. Billy Graham said this, We are rich in the things that perish, but poor in the things of the Spirit. We are rich in gadgets, but poor in faith. We're rich in goods, but poor in grace. We're rich in know-how, but poor in character. We're rich in words, but poor in deeds. Jesus said that our life does not consist of material possessions, that we have our peace of mind, our joy, our happiness, our comfort, and our eternal destiny does not depend upon our earthly positions, possessions. Sorry. So the question we have to ask is, well, does that mean that you can't have nice things? And the answer is no. All you have to look through the Bible is see all these people who were blessed financially. You see Abraham, you see Boaz, you see King David, you see Solomon. But in those stories of, of being financially wealthy and having lots of cattle, and, and you see Job who had everything, but you, amidst that you see men who loved God. And it wasn't about the money, it was always a tool. But we come to Solomon who wrote Proverbs, and we see what a disaster his life was because he took his money and spent it on himself instead of helping other people. So you see there's this whole um, two ways to look at it. You see in the New Testament, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a bad guy at the time. But he realized when he gave his life to Jesus that giving was so much more better than taking from people what wasn't his to take. You see Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very wealthy man, and he's the one who gave his tomb so that Jesus could live in. God lets people be wealthy. The point is, are you going to use your wealth for God or are you going to use it for yourself? You see all the women who followed Jesus, and they always gave money to, the, to, to Jesus to continue his ministry. You see Lydia, who used her home in the early church to have Bible studies to, for the first, um, you know, to, to, so people could come and learn the gospel. But then you see other people like the rich young ruler who was just like, I'm rich. And Jesus said, follow me. And he's like, yeah, that seems a little difficult. See, Ananias and Sapphira who sold their land to keep, but kept some of the proceeds to, for themselves. See, it's this whole idea, what are you living for? Is your life about you or is your life about God? And it really is, that's where we have to land today. A wise person is someone who is rich in the things of God and not in the stuff. So here's where I want to end today with this whole thing. I want to end talking about what this last 11 weeks has has been about. Because here's what we learn is that these windows here is what we talked about at the very, very beginning. And we see them as wisdom is calling from from, from up here. Like this window is wisdom. Let's say the red window is foolishness. Uh, there, there's all these windows that are calling and vying for your attention. And we always have a choice on who we're going to listen to. I want to go back to this verse here. It was one we used probably at the very beginning, Proverbs 8, 34. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied is the man who listens to me, wisdom, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post at my doors. Here's what I want to end with is this, that if you want to live a life of wisdom, it is going to take a daily investment of your time. See, I want wisdom, I want peace, I want joy, I want to know what God has to think, but those things do not just happen on your own. I put these jars up here because I started thinking that this is what it's life. Like, some people, they don't really want to read their Bible And when they don't, their life is going to look like this. Pretend this is you. You're going to have a little bit down here, but nothing else has really changed up here. Before the Israelites crossed into the Jordan, this is what Joshua told the Israelites. Joshua 1.7 says, Only you be strong and courageous that you may do according to the law of Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Here it is. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth 
but you shall meditate it on, meditate on it day and night. It doesn't say you should meditate it on it for one hour when you go to church on Sunday or, or twice a year at Christmas and Easter. It says if you want to live this kind of a life, to live different in Proverbs, you have to meditate on the Word of God day and night. It has to be something that permeates into your life. If you want to live a life of wisdom, you need to open Proverbs and read it every single day. Now, I will have a, give you a confession from me. Proverbs has been, I was just telling someone in the bathroom, this is probably one of the hardest series I've ever done. Proverbs is hard for me. I get the principles and I get it and I want to live by it, but I like reading Psalms better for me just because Psalms tells me more about, you know, I just, Psalms comforts me more than, than Proverbs does. But what I've learned from this series is how important it is to, to use Proverbs as a way that got to let God speak to you. The other morning, I was having a problem with something I had to say at Bible study yesterday, and I wasn't sure if I should say it or not. And so I said, all right, I'm going to open Proverbs. It was like the 17th or whatever day it was. So I opened up Proverbs 17, and there it was. Right there was my answer I needed. See, that's how God speaks to us. We open up the word, he speaks to us, and it changes us. That's what happens. And I want to be the kind of person that says, every day I'm going to read my chapter in Proverbs. If you want to live that life, you've got to do that. If you really want to know God, know how he works, then you're going to have to open the Bible. I put you, uh, gave you all a a Bible reading plan today. Uh, I think for those of you watching online, I think it's online under our handout section. I think you can get the same Bible reading program. It's a read through the Bible in a year, but if you notice on the Bible reading plan every day, you're reading a chapter in Proverbs. And if you can actually do that, and you're like, you know what, I want to try to read through the Bible in a year. For some of you, it may be, I'm going to read through it in two years. But always circle the Proverbs that you've read for that day. And continually do that, because that is exactly what's going to to change your life and help you to be the kind of person you want to be. Here's a picture of some Post-it notes. I started thinking, this is what most people live their life, their Christian life like. Little bits and pieces. Oh, I learned that at church today, and I learned that next one in Bible study, and I learned that verse. But, but nobody, everyone's just getting bits and pieces of, of things in life. And, and, and yet, well, look at the next screen. Here's what I want. One big picture. I want you to read the Bible, see Genesis to Revelation, see the whole entire epic story of God and how that affects your life and mine. Because when we do that and we keep the word of God in front of us and we see this big story, here's what it teaches us to do on the next screen. It teaches us how to handle problems God's way. Your life, your marriage, your kids, your work, your whatever it is, there's problems all the time in this life, but we can handle it God's way or we can handle it our way. And what we've learned about Proverbs is how to handle being a wife God's way, how to handle anger God's way, how to anger or how to handle like conflict God's way, how to run from sin God's way, how to be a good friend God's way. See, those are all the things that we learn from Proverbs. And what you do when you start reading the Bible is this. It will either refocus your thinking to God's way of thinking. God has this life for us, and it's a great life, but in order for us to get that, we've got to open the Bible and read it to know what he says. And when we do, God becomes suddenly big and powerful when you read the stories that we have for all these Proverbs series with big men in the Bible that show us that we see this character of God, and and then we insert that into our life, and it changes us, and it makes us live different. In the end, you're going to live better. You're going to make better choices and you're going to not be as foolish. Proverbs 8.35 says this. Whoever finds me wisdom, which is what we've talked about, finds life and draws forth and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who misses me, if we miss wisdom and we end up in the foolishness realm, sins against me, wrongs, and injures himself, all who hate me, love and court death. That's always going to be our, pro, our, our, our choices in life. Are we going to go the way of wise or are we going to go the way of foolishness? Proverbs 1.20, we'll start all the way back at the beginning. Wisdom calls aloud in the streets. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. And that's why you and I need to open the Bible daily to see what is wisdom telling us for that particular day. Chapter 9, verse 1, will end right here in these last six verses. Wisdom has built her spacious and sufficient house. She has hewn out and set up her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. 
She sent out her maid and she calls from the highest places of the cities. And this is what wisdom says. Whoever is naive or inexperienced, let him turn in here. If you lack understanding, come, come into here. Come eat my food. Drink the wine I've mixed. Leave behind your foolishness, your foolishness and live and walk in the ways of insight and understanding. Being wise is one of those people that takes everything that Proverbs says to heart. You open up the Bible and here's your question. Do you want to be this full? Do you want to be this full? Or do you want to be this full? Because you're going to start out looking this and then you're going to start reading Proverbs. You're going to be like, well, I used to be angry and I used to be bitter and I didn't have a very good marriage. And then you started reading the Bible. You started reading Proverbs and then suddenly you look a little bit different here. And then the more you read, uh, now you're going to be, and now you're living this life and you look different. Everything in your life looks different because you've done what God's called you to do is open the Bible daily, what Joshua said to do, and read it and let God change our lives. And that is what I hope we learned from Proverbs, that you and I walk out of here living different. Father, thank you so much for ah, this series. Thank you for what you've taught me in this series. And I've had a lot to learn, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for these women, for the people that are watching us online, however they found us. I pray, God, that you will use this series to change us. Help us to be the people that want to look like the jar with the most red water to say, God, I want to be different in everything that I do. I pray, God, desperately that you will change us. That's our heart for this. And if anyone doesn't know Jesus, that's the starting point to wisdom. I pray that today will be the day they say, Jesus, come in my life and change me. Thank you, God, for this time at North Valley that you've given us, that you've let us have this study here um, for the graciousness of this church. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for all you do. And bless all the women that are involved. I pray that their women's ministry will now take off And um, this will be the start to something great for them. In Jesus' name, amen. You have to be reading your Bible. I can't tell you. I always say this. I don't know how it changes us. It just does. The sickness, the the, the tragedy, the death, the the hit on drugs, the whatever. God wants to use, well, where did God come from? And if he created us, who created him? And how is that we tend to look at every battle and every problem in this natural realm. Like what I see, I see, you know, but see, we don't get it here because we think Jesus asking him in our life just means uh, I get to go to heaven.